Hi, Carl Winkler here at Electrosonics. Uh, the following video is a second of a series of four wireless side chats uh, that I gave during the COVID-19 shutdown. And uh, this one is about the seven most common issues with wireless microphones and how to solve them. Hope you find the information useful. Uh, be sure to comment and subscribe. Thanks for watching. So just a little bit about me in case you don't know me. I'm sure I've uh, been Facebook friends with most of you, but uh, if we haven't met in person, um, I started out as a musician and got a degree in uh, string performance in uh, 1988. Uh, I went to school at USC in Los Angeles for audio engineering, recording arts, and finished in 1991. Uh, I went to work for the US Air Force uh, with their jazz band, the Airmen of Note, as front of house mixer uh, in the mid-90s. Then I went to the Sennheiser organization uh, to manage the Neumann microphone product line. And then I went to Electrosonics, where I still am today, more than 15 years later, kind of found my home. And it turns out that Electrosonics is in my hometown, which is a wonderful thing. I've uh, been a syn synergetic audio uh, concepts instructor for several of their two-day wireless classes. And I've been an author for Live Sound Magazine and Pro Sound Web since 2003. A little bit of background about me. Uh, there I am back in the day of 100% analog stuff. You can see the cassette machine up there. Uh, and this is at a 4th of July concert near the Potomac River in uh, the Washington, D.C. area. I did a lot of shows like that and toured uh, all over the United States and in Japan as well. I mentioned this in the earlier uh, session about the intro to Spectrum, uh, but this is the first wireless mic system that I used, uh, and it was already old at that time in the mid-1990s. This is a system from the late uh, 80s. It was a good system, Vega uh, Diversity Wireless, and it had uh, companded analog audio, sounded pretty good, uh, and excellent range, uh, VHF, and this one, single frequency, 181.225 megahertz. Uh, there I am at the White House at a Christmas party uh, mixing sound for President Clinton, who sat in with our band and played on the sax for a couple tunes. Good memories. And then one of the bigger shows I did was at the, uh, uh, in Washington, D.C., the Constitution Hall, and it was a recreation of the Glenn Miller, Glenn Miller Army Air Corps Orchestra. And uh, so it was a 44-piece band. The spotlight is on the group of Tuskegee Airmen that were in attendance of that show. And there's my mix position in the lower left corner there, overlooking the whole thing. Okay, so let's get to the problems, because that's why you're here, to learn about what, uh, what we're doing. I feel like the most common problem I run into is the lack of frequency band planning. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that wireless systems of different types, let's say comm systems, uh, IFBs, IEM type systems, and wireless mics are mixed together in the same frequency band, and they shouldn't be, if at all possible. Or if they're all in the same band, like with today's wideband type equipment, you need to move them to different areas of the spectrum and keep them away from each other so that they don't step on each other. When you have overlap between the filter bands of the various systems, then they can interfere with each other and reduce range and cause problems. So that's exactly what we're trying to avoid. Part of this, of course, is understanding your local RF spectrum and knowing which bands to choose or which parts of the band to use. And there's more than one type of tool that you can use for this purpose. Uh, you can use a spectrum analyzer, uh, which is a kind of real-time tool, uh, although it's limited because it, it doesn't see exactly the way that your receivers see the spectrum, uh, although it is wideband and real-time, so very handy tool. And, of course, the receivers themselves can usually scan and show you detailed pictures of the spectrum within the band of the receivers. 
Now, one thing that, uh, a trick that I've learned is that you can take a tap off of your receiver uh, antenna network and pipe it into your uh, spectrum analyzer. And it's a way that your spectrum analyzer can see what your antenna system see, because it won't do that if you're just running on a whip. So that's very handy. So there's the differences is, of course, the receivers are not wideband and not real time. And the uh, spectrum analyzer doesn't see exactly the same thing that your receiver see. So having both tools is handy. So one of the tricks with frequency band planning, of course, is to remember all sources. This is a very common thing that I've run into is that some types of RF sources are forgotten when a band plan is developed. Maybe there's in-house systems that are being used, or maybe uh, the comm guys show up late, or maybe they're early and, and they forget to check in with everybody else, or whatever it might be. There's a number of reasons why some types of sources might be skipped. Uh, but think about that. There's, uh, there's vocal mics, there's a voice of God mic on a set, uh, people giving speeches. Uh, maybe there's a little uh, a school a uh, theater troupe doing a, a little presentation or something like that. And then players' mics, if you're talking about a sporting event. So a lot of things to consider. And in the earlier session, we covered kind of the basics of this, but we didn't get into a lot of detail about how much spectrum is left in the U.S. and what we can use it for. Essentially, our spectrum is shared with TV broadcasts. And so that is the range in the U.S. and some other countries as well between 470 megahertz and 608. And in other countries, there's up into the 700 megahertz now, uh, but that's changing as well. Now, some have asked us about uh, what parts of the spectrum above 608 are still available. And there are some very small slices. Uh, there's two megahertz unlicensed right above 614. And then there is uh, 10 megahertz uh, in the duplex gap in the middle of the spectrum. Now, there are specific limits for that spectrum, including a, t a 20 milliwatt limit, which for analog systems isn't much, especially if there's a, a high noise floor, uh, but you can access it. Uh, in fact, there's four megahertz there between 653 and 657. That's for licensed systems only. That's part 74 license holders. So there are a couple things up there, but there's certain restrictions on them. Let's look at an example frequency band plan. And this is something that uh, we've talked about in many sessions at AES and some of the SIN ODCON training classes. And uh, you know, a lot of it is divided out by the type of systems that are being used. So for instance, you might have Comtech IFBs in the 72 to 88 megahertz range, and there's nothing else there. So those will typically work fairly well, although the noise floor in that region of the spectrum is fairly high. Uh, in the upper VHF, you might have uh, intercom receivers, like from ra radioactive designs, uh, and IFB uh, transmitter systems, like from the electrosonics. And I believe uh, Comtech has a 216 megahertz uh, IFB as well. Then, at least in North America, uh, the walkie-talkies, land mobile radio, uh, 450 to 470, which uh, can be a problem if you've got systems with wireless mics starting at 470 because walkie-talkies are typically going to be uh, fairly high power like four and five watts and things like that so uh, it's one thing to watch is that if walkie-talkies are on set if there's any way that they can turn their power down they probably don't need that much power then of course we've got some wireless mic systems uh, most brands are made in this region 470 to 495 uh, then you might have some more IFBs and intercoms or maybe some in-ears between 512 and 555. Wireless mics again, 565 to 608. But you can get the idea here how these systems are divided up so that they're not stepping on each other. That'll increase the performance a great deal. If you are a license holder, you can use uh, wireless mics now in uh, the 941 and 960 band. For instance, we have ENG systems there and we also have the Venue 2 system in that band. So... Uh, it's, it can be a good one, and it's quite clean. Then there's uh, an STL required. That means a, a site temporary license from the FCC is required to use the 1.4 gig band because it's shared with AFTRAC. That's the aeronautical testing 
band. Uh, so once in a while you see those really long stick mics at uh, some events at big games and so on. And those are often in the 1.4 gig range and they've got a, a license for that. You might have uh, decked uh, wireless intercoms up at 1.9. You might have some other systems at 2.4 gig, uh, which is of course the Wi-Fi frequency band. And then there's a point to point system by Neutrik in the five gigahertz range. So all of these are viable. And again, you wanna keep the different types of systems separate from each other. That's the whole idea of a band plan. Okay, the number two most common problem that I see and that we see at Electrosonics and most of my colleagues agree is poor receiver antenna placement. So I don't mean to call anyone out with this slide here of this, what is a fairly typical setup on a film set. Uh, but because these antennas are close to each other and you have both transmitting and receiving antennas within inches of each other, this will most likely reduce your range. And an easy way to test that is to do a scan with everything turned on and then turn off your IFB transmitters and do another scan and you'll see a big difference in the noise floor of your receivers. Uh, so if at all possible, physically separate your IFB transmitters, uh, antennas, and your receiver antennas and I recommend just getting another stand, another mast for that, if at all possible, and just move them physically as far apart as you possibly can. Here's a common one that we see in the install world is uh, receivers in an equipment rack. It could be a metal rack, you know, and the antennas are just on the back of the receiver enclosed in a rack. Now you can imagine that the range of a system like this is, is pretty terrible. So the way to improve that is simply mount remote mounted antennas on the outside of the equipment rack and run them in with short cables to connect to your receivers. Easy to solve. This scan shows uh, a wideband scan from 470 to 608 megahertz. Actually, this goes all the way up to 692 megahertz with antennas in a rack and part of the issue is that other equipment in the rack generates RF noise, anything with a processor. This is the same receiver system in the same location, but with the antennas moved to the outside of the rack. That's the only difference. And you know which one I'd pick. Here's another one uh, from my friend Tim Veer at Shure. Uh, it's a picture of a couple of Shure paddle antennas used for a multi-use facility. And of course, they've got equipment racks behind the cage. And because maybe they'll play basketball in there or maybe there's some other kind of activity that they don't want the system to get damaged. So they put it in a cage. And uh, the users marveled that when the door to the cage is open, it works. But when the door is closed, it doesn't work. And uh, it's just a metal cage that the, the openings are just small enough to stop UHF wave to get through, kind of like something similar to a microwave oven. Don't forget that receivers have polar pattern, receiver antennas, excuse me, all antennas uh, have polar patterns. And it's a really good idea to know those polar patterns as a way of understanding how to best position the antennas. For instance, our very popular SNA 600 dipole antenna has a circular polar pattern in the lateral plane, in other words, perpendicular to the veins on the antenna, and it has a sort of a toroidal pattern, so there's nulls above and below the antenna. So it gives you some idea where to place it, and I often see these things set up incorrectly, uh, looking like a T, uh, when they really should be like this, with the veins vertical. Directional antennas also, of course, have polar patterns, as you would imagine. And the most common type, the LPDA, has a cardioid-like pickup pattern in the lateral plane, which is a fairly forgiving. It's not a laser beam. That's something to remember. 
and it has a fairly strong null to the rear. And then if you look at it from above and below the antenna, it has very strong nulls directly above and below the antenna. This can be real handy in terms of placement. Don't forget that you can use the nulls of the antennas to point towards things that you don't want it to pick up. Like if you're in, a, in an area where there's TV towers nearby, I know Mount Wilson in Los Angeles is a real problem. Uh, you can point the rear of the antenna towards the, uh, the undesired source and that will give you some better signal to noise ratio. That's a handy trick. And of course, there are specialized antennas for certain frequency ranges, like our PCA 900 on the right there. That's designed for the, uh, the 941 band equipment and uh, 928 to ni or 902 to 928 megahertz. And uh, so it goes, you know, goes up to one gigahertz. Real handy. And then uh, something like the RF venue, the collapsible helical, is a really cool antenna. Uh, it's, uh, it's the only helical I know that, that folds flat. Uh, there's several other helical designs, and they're, they all work well, but this is the most portable one, and it's in a really tough nylon covering. Uh, so we have some of those up at the Santa Fe Opera as an example, and they have really, really good coverage. So antenna rules of thumb for placement. For one thing, the primary goal is to put them line of sight to your transmitters so that you are picking up the signal without uh, physical uh, interference. And the secondary consideration is what's called the Fresnel zone. Uh, and this is illustrated there by seeing like, uh, like FM radio transmissions and what happens if a building protrudes into it, causing a shadow behind the building. Even though you might have direct line of sight from one point on the antenna to the other antenna, the receiver, uh, you might have uh, a loss of range if there's obstruction. So on a stage or a set, you might have large objects like cars or a metal set piece or big concrete or something that may reduce your range. So that's something to keep in mind. Which brings us to that a good rule of thumb is to have your antennas about 10 feet high looking down at the talent. Another very common problem that we hear about often is bad RF gain structure. And uh, this is, uh, has to do with the signal strength of your RF and what happens to it, uh, it through an antenna, in the cable, if there's boosters and things like that. So what this chart shows is the different loss of different types of RF coax 50 ohm cable. And you can see that it's a pretty dramatic difference between RG174, which has quite a bit of loss, all the way to the RG8A, uh, the 9913 F7 material, which has very little loss. But the main point I want to make here is that the only reason to boost your, uh, your RF in an antenna system is to overcome the loss of your cable. So you can find this kind of chart online. Just look up RF coax loss 50 ohm and you'll see a lot of tables from different manufacturers uh, showing the loss of their cable material. So you need to know, keep an inventory of your cables and understand how much loss is through the cable because a very common problem is over boosting. I see that often. People using amplified antennas when it's really not needed. So just keep this RF rule of thumb in mind that what you want is unity gain of the RF signal from your antenna to your receiver. So you can do the simple math here, antenna gain, RF amp gain if the, amp, if the antenna is amplified, cable loss, splitters lose signal as well, usually about 3 or 4 dB per split. So, you know, a, a two-way split loses 3 to 4 dB, four-way split loses 6 or 7 dB, and so on. Here's an example gain structure diagram that I borrowed again from Tim Veer at Shure, showing 
uh, the calculations, very simple, made for like an installation. It looks like they have four salons. Maybe this is a hotel with ballrooms and they want to put some antennas in there. They got a diversity system. And uh, it looks like that the cable, 175 feet of RG58, is too much loss for this system. No matter how, even though they've boosted 20 dB, which is quite a bit, uh, it's not enough. They've, uh, they end up at minus 10 dB or minus 15 dB uh, at the other end. So that's, that's not enough. So the, the way to solve this in this particular case would be to do that long run uh, with l better cable, and then you wouldn't have a problem. And one thing I want to mention is that my personal rule of thumb is that a little bit of loss is always preferable to too much gain. You can lose as much as 6 dB and still be better off than amplifying too much and, uh, and, and clobbering your receivers with signal. Okay, next up, most common problem is lack of frequency coordination. A lot of truth to that. But while we're at it, let's look at some math. This really is an an explanation of how intermods are created and that, that they have mathematical relationships. If you start with two signals, one at 650 megahertz and one at 670 megahertz, if they pass through any nonlinear device, and that would be an amplifier, an RF receiver, uh, intermods have the potential to be generated depending on the level of the signals coming in. And here you can see that third order intermods, there's two phantom generated signals within the passband of our device. And that's exactly what we're trying to avoid putting other channels on those frequencies because they can cause interference. So how do we solve this? The most common way is to use computer software, obviously. Computers are great at making calculations like this very quickly on a large scale. And so one of the common programs that's been out there for many years from professional wireless systems is IAS, or Intermod Analysis Software. This is a great tool. I use it myself. Uh, we've got several copies at Electrosonics, and most of the professionals that I know in the field use this software. But you have to keep in mind it is offline software. It will check in with a database of FCC known licensed uh, TV channels, and, uh, and, but it doesn't uh, do a scan. You can import a scan uh, from your device in the CSV format, uh, but it doesn't do a scan itself. It's not, it's not online looking at your receivers. But it's a great tool for pre-coordinating a large installation. I've used it hundreds of times and uh, with a lot of success. Uh, it's not free, though. I believe the software is around $500, if I'm not mistaken. Our wireless designer software uh, is uh, available for free, and this does connect to your uh, wireless devices and takes the scan directly. Uh, it can connect to the Duet system, to Venue, Venue 2, uh, DSQD receiver, or the older digital DSW system, and they can all be run concurrently. Uh, it's pretty uh, slick, uh, it's pretty quick, and uh, it does take some, some knowledge to use it. And in fact, I'm gonna do a session later this week, stay tuned, on some tips and tricks for wireless designer. And this program is always evolving as well uh, to make it uh, add features and make it easier to use. But essentially, this is a software allowing you to bring in a scan Make your calculations so that your channels that you're going to use are not stepping on each other with intermods, and they're also avoiding local interference as much as possible. The number five most common problem that I see is bad transmitter or mic placement.
So I'm not able to, uh, to hear your feedback directly, but you can probably guess that there are some things that are good about this placement and some things that aren't so good about this placement. Um, you're welcome to make some comments on the feed if you like, uh, but I'll break it down for you. You always want to check antenna against skin or antenna against damp undergarments because that will absorb RF dramatically. In fact, one of the most common things I hear uh, lately, especially with really small transmitters, is, hey, I'm not getting the range from this, even though it's the same power as one of my other transmitters. Well, if it's so tiny, it's very easy to put it on places on the body that cover it uh, with flesh and with uh, you know, clothing or uh, costuming material that may block RF. So it's something to really be careful of. So this placement's not too bad, uh, but if I were to put my arm down, it would cover the unit. So possibly it'd be better on the small of the back, but again, that depends on where the receiver antennas are. And these are the questions you want to ask as you're, con as you're considering placement of a transmitter. In fact, here's a diagram that illustrates that a placement of a body pack transmitter on the small of a back generates a hypercardioid transmission pattern in the lateral plane considering that the body blocks the RF or absorbs a fair amount of it. Okay, the number six most common issue that I see is poor audio gain structure. In fact, this is important enough. We did a video about this topic specifically, showing that with very much underset audio gain, it can actually affect the range of your wireless system. That video is on our YouTube channel. Take a look. And in fact, it has a cameo from a Roadrunner, which is why I believe the video is so popular. It has nothing to do with the quality of the information. So in, just to clarify what the signal chain is through a wireless, I think everybody knows this, but... You've got a microphone, and then there is a, usually some kind of a gain setting in the transmitter. And you want to maximize that so that there's good signal-to-noise in the transmitted signal. Then you're picking it up with an antenna, and it goes to a receiver. Then you've got the connected devices, a recorder or a mixer, depending on what kind of work you're doing. So the output of the receiver is another place to set gain, and then the input of your device. Next. So... Here's another illustration of the importance of doing this. If your audio gain isn't high enough, there's not enough signal to noise from the channel noise of the wireless system itself. There's always some kind of noise in the system. Newer systems are better. Digital systems are even better. But there is still some channel noise that you've got to be careful of. In fact, this is so important that we typically put a small card in with your transmitter so that uh, it's got some tips about setting gain so that you tickle the limiter. Uh, it, and if you see a red blink, it is not clipping, it's limiting, and our limiters have 30 dB of headroom. So it's definitely worthwhile to get the signal hot enough to touch the limiters. And keep in mind that your native receiver output is line level. So if you are reducing it, you are attenuating the signal. And recorders and mixers typically have line level inside their device as well. So if you have to boost on the way in, you are amplifying the signal. Anytime you cut and then boost again, you're, you're uh, slightly decreasing your signal to noise ratio uh, and your dynamic range of your system. Finally, number seven is lack of maintenance.
Here's a list of the most common faults. <clears throat> uh, a battery management policy. We talked about that briefly earlier uh, because wire, uh, you know, wireless mics have become more commonly used with rechargeable batteries, more and more so. Uh, I recommend everyone get used to some kind of uh, charging system, keeping track of your batteries, dating them the first charge, uh, keeping track of how many times they've been charged. This is the world we're living in, and it's good because it saves money and it's good for the environment to use rechargeables. And uh, the difference in cost is, is staggering over over a period of time, like a year. I, th I put it, in fact, it's uh, so important I put it on the list twice. <laughs> but there's other things to watch out for as well. And uh, one thing is uh, these days with the concern about the COVID-19 virus, people are wanting to keep their transmitters really clean. And actually, we're just posting today on the Electrosonic site, uh, one of our wire lists is about how to sanitize your transmitters. And the main way to do that is with uh, fairly high purity isopropyl alcohol, at least 70%. Uh, so you can buy that at a drugstore if they have any, or you can mix it down slightly from 91% with a little bit of water. And uh, don't spray it on or dunk anything in it though. Still a liquid and you don't want that in your, in your transmitters, but you can wipe your transmitters with this uh, stuff and your lav mics. And I also saw DPA's got a good uh, tutorial on sanitizing the lav mic itself. Okay, well, we've covered a lot of ground with this session and we went pretty quickly. It goes faster when I uh, can't talk directly with you and have your questions live. But uh, to conclude, you know, having a bulletproof wireless system really is a matter of planning and coordination and good system design and avoiding these seven common pitfalls. If you can do that, your wireless system will generally work much better, give you more reliable results, better sound, better range. And, you know, frequency coordination isn't magic. It's not guesswork either. It's... Uh, it requires software and programming. Uh, you could do it yourself in Excel if you're an Excel whiz, but it's much easier to, to use the software packages that are out there. There's one called Frequency Finder for uh, mobile use on your phone. And uh, then there's the PC or Mac-based ones like our wireless designer. I think IAS is PC only. And the better you get with this software, the more you use it, uh, the experience really counts and is very helpful. Okay, everybody, I'm going to sign off. Thanks again for watching. I'll check the boards for your comments and questions. Have a great one.